Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the January 12, 2010 first public forum of the Bean Farm Task Force. I'm Gene Tacey, Chairman. Uh, please, if you have not signed in, do so. The sheets are on the table in the back, and there's also one up front. Um, I was going to get all of the uh, articles out of the Gazette and the Republican and post them on a board here. I was going to buy the papers, but it was 124 articles, and it meant me buying 72 papers. <laughs> so you don't have them. You'll have to look them up yourself. Uh, as chairman, I do not have a commitment to a particular outcome, and I'll speak only the truth that will make you aware of harvests to be reaped and the pitfalls to the best of my ability. There is no done deal here. Remember that. Uh, the hat I wear as chairman is one that compiles information from the Agricultural Commission, the Conservation Commission, the Recreation Commission, Zoning Revisions Committee, the public and various other agencies, trusts, and more. The members of this force represent the interests of their respective committees and should be applauded for their passion and their commitment to public process. I cannot imagine our North Hinton community without agriculture, recreation, conservation, or land use planning. The people that will advocate tonight for this task force in what they believe to be in the best interest of the community and have spent hundreds of hours involved in research for presentation to you for your input. It is hard to explain the amount of work this committee has done today alone some 40 messages. They are not compensated in any way except in feeling good about what they do for the community. Some of the questions that were put forth at the December 7, 2009 meeting in this room have answers or partial answers. Some require scientific review and are not so readily available and will be addressed in a timely fashion. As chairman, I will make all information available and present objectivity. Early on, I was in receipt of messages almost solely from agricultural advocates. So to extract input from recreation, I made that fact known at a meeting and in came the ball field advocates. I made that fact known and they now leveled the playing field but still no messages saying, don't buy it. But I know you're out there, so I commented on that at City Council last Thursday, and in came the don't buy it messages. So anyway, it worked as it's important to hear from all. Do not confuse my role as chairman of the task force with my role as Ward 7 City Councilor. So we have a lot to cover tonight, so I'll shut up. Please be appreciative and respectful of all. And right now I'd like to introduce Kevin Lake to go over the process to date, and then I will introduce individual commission members for their presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Uh, am I holding this close enough that you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, we thought it important that everybody realize the, the history of the situation. Sometimes people come in midstream and are unaware, and things look a little different than they do if you understand of the entire history. So let's go back. Uh, the Recreation Commission, and I'm chairman of the Conservation Commission, so I, I, I am not directly involved with recreation, but um, the Recreation Commission has been for many years searching for uh, a playing field and recreational use land within the city of Northampton. Uh, a year plus ago, uh, the City Council and the CPC, the Community Preservation Committee, um, allocated uh, $40,000 uh, for recreation to explore parcels throughout the city. One of those that was uh, under consideration that the uh, Recreation Committee was watching for the last three years ever since it came on the market was the Bean Family Farm. As the price came down and it became more realistic, they approached, uh, rec approached uh, uh, the city planning department and that resulted in the first uh, negotiations between the city and uh, the Bean family. Um, in mid-November, uh, following these negotiations, the city council asked the three commissions, uh, recreation, uh, conservation, um, and agriculture, uh, to consider the parcel, to jointly look at it, representing uh, the three different perspectives. Um, on December 1st, uh, there was a uh, meeting at the Smith Volk Library of the three commissions for the first time. And we agreed on some basics. And on uh, December 3rd, we conveyed those basics to a city council meeting. And those basics included, one, that we recognized that 
earnest people of goodwill and equally heartfelt commitment to the city would hold different views about what the best use of the land was. That they were all good solutions. There were no bad ideas here. Two, that our three charters, uh, the three commission's charters, were not necessarily at odds with each other, and that pending a vigorous process, multiple uses of the parcel was a possibility. <coughs> Third, we all agreed and, and emphatically recommended to the City Council that it's better to protect this land for something <coughs> rather than to see it develop. Um, and fourth, we committed to work together to gather input and do research that would enable us to make a recommendation to the City Council about what the best use of the land might be. <coughs> so that was uh, presented to City Council on December 3rd. On December 7th, we had in this room um, 300 odd people uh, as a kickoff for the three commissions to hear questions and comments, um, watch the city planning department make some presentations so there was a, uh, a beginning of a very public and open discussion about what is the land, what are the issues, what are the potentials, um, and we were gathering that information, including 70-odd uh, questions that were generated from the public at that point, Some of, most of which have had at least a partial answer since then. As, as Gene said, um, we make, we're, we're ranking the questions so that those that are most crucial for going forward, we can try to address first because we have some limited time frames to work with. Um, but we're also trying to get a beginning handle on all of the questions. And on the city's website are at least partial answers as they exist so far to that. And Marie also has 10 copies um, if people want to thumb through them um, this evening. Um, it's about a 12 or 13 or 14 page document. Um, uh, of uh, partial answers to the questions that were generated in this room uh, back on December 7th. Um, on December uh, uh, 15th, uh, the three commissions met to digest, look at the questions that it, and comments that the public had made, um, and make a broad recommendation uh, to city council um, that yes, we should go forward, yes, it was desirable land, and two days later, the City Council on December 17th authorized the creation of this task force <coughs> as um, you see it before you, uh, which had its first uh, meeting on December 28th as a logistics and planning meeting, um, and then uh, on the 8th, um, met to review site possibilities um, and at that point, add uh, Peter Flinker and uh, Donna Lilborn, who are land use specialists from the Zoning Revisions Committee, um, to the group. Uh, and here we are. So that is the, the history that has gotten us um, to this point. Um, please recognize that all of those meetings that I just described have been posted in public meetings. Um, there is nothing that has been done um, out of public view uh, that, as Jean says, um, this is a work in progress, and everybody's a participant. Gene? I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. Nobody's out of the joint here. Um, the, uh, the agriculture, we're going to have an overview by the representatives of the Agriculture Commission, Richard Jasky. <laughs> hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, First of all, <coughs> I want to introduce myself. I'm Richard Jasky, Vice Chairman of the uh, B, uh, excuse me, of the Agricultural Commission and a Bean Task Force member. I'm a hay and straw farmer. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Onasta, Stan John. He's Chairman of the Ag Commission. He a, runs a market garden farm, hay and livestock. <coughs> ben James did a presentation here um, the, uh, at the first forum. He's a CSA farm and has vegetables. Bob Borowski uh, is a sheep farmer. He's a member of the commission as well. John Mabola, hay and vegetable farm. John Kelly he's, uh, runs the agricultural uh, operations at Smith School. And Chip Parsons has a, <coughs> has a family uh, farm raising sheep and corn with land in Northampton. Uh, so I just wanted everybody to know that there are seven members of our commission. Uh, we're fairly new. We've only been in existence. This is our third year. Uh, so the other thing is I want to thank all who have come out and supported agriculture 
during these forums and meetings has been very overwhelming for all of us. And we really appreciate it. We think there's a great uh, support out there for ag in this community. We never uh, realized that until this all came to floor. And we're certainly going to learn a lot from this and work together more uh, as best we can. Um, I might be repeating a little bit of what Kevin uh, Lake had uh, just uh, run through, but uh, we found out at our October meeting that uh, this bean property was coming up for purchase possibly by the city. And we were not informed previously, so we really uh, were very surprised about it and uh, had not had a lot of time to uh, even uh, think about it. Uh, we uh, made a resolution at that meeting to support the bean farm for agriculture. <coughs> so John and I had uh, <coughs> next attended Conservation Recreation Commission meetings uh, to inform these commissions of our existence to make sure that they understood that we were very concerned about this farm and uh, we were received uh, very nicely and we were able to get uh, the point across that we are here and we're here to support Ag. Uh, we also had, at that point, uh, joint commission meetings when it became uh, uh, to the, to the uh, forefront that this is a great concern. So again, we met with uh, Conservation and Rec. And we also resolved to work together, all of us, uh, all the commissions. Uh, then there uh, eventually uh, became the formation of the Bean Task Force. Uh, which I am representing Yeah. Uh, there's going to be continued <coughs> meetings to gain more knowledge to help us uh, get to the uh, uh, core issues, uh, see if we can resolve and get, come together a little bit more uh, closely on the land, and that's ongoing. Uh, the Ag Commission feels strongly and has resolved to work with RAC on a joint approach to this uh, bean farm situation. And believe me, it is a very complex, very, very complex situation. Uh, we have ad advocated strongly uh, for agriculture use uh, at all our meetings together as best we can. We realize there are constraints but we also realize that we must work together because uh, this is a very important piece of property. It's adjoining agricultural property, and it's really key, I think, that we uh, try to keep this in agriculture and also work with RAC for their needs. And, and I think that's very, very important. We seem to constantly come back to that all the time. As much as we'd like to see it all in ag, uh, at this point, uh, we do feel very strongly that that might be the best approach uh, to work together. Uh, there was <coughs> about, oh God, 70 questions at that meeting on the 7th. And uh, I just checked a few of them here um, to just give a, just kind of a quick overview of what the answers might be to these questions. Uh, question number three uh, was, for example, are there requirements for agriculture to be organic if on the bean farm. Now again, these questions are pertaining to agriculture as best I can determine them. And, and uh, the response would be that uh, uh, not necessarily so, that the city doesn't have any requirements. Uh, the Conservation Commission has converted two of the three farmland parcels uh, to organic. But at this point, we haven't uh, uh, discussed that uh, in any depth. But, uh, that for your answer to that question, the city uh, at this point doesn't have any requirements for that. Uh, question number six, <coughs> can the city as owner of the property dictate to farmers who lease the land what to grow or who or will the land be put to its best agricultural use as determined by the farmer? And uh, we can't really dictate, I believe, what these uh, farmers can raise. Uh, diversity sometimes is, is a real uh, plus. Uh, so the answer could be uh, there are a possibility of both options 
Um, but the more you restrict this land, uh, if it you know goes uh, as we move along towards agriculture, I think there there's also going to be less response from potential farmers. So uh, I think that um, hopefully will give you an answer to for that question that was asked. Have you weighed number question number ten? <clears throat> have you weighed the conservation value of rec fields versus farmland? That's ongoing right now. We're looking at that very carefully. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can move our ag fields around and the rec fields around and uh, see if we can uh, try to put the better, the best land we can to ag and uh, working with rec to see if we can. Uh, make some fields for them out of maybe fields that would be suitable for ag. So we're working diligently on that to try to see if we can come up with an answer. <clears throat> Question 21 is can our existing farms be encouraged to produce, lo uh, to produce local produce? I think that question is very obvious. There's a lot of farms locally uh, and I think we're, we've got an awful lot of interest in, in people uh, with our CESA and CSA farms. And I would say that that question is absolutely yes. Uh, I think we want to promote, uh, and, and there is currently uh, products being produced right here in Northampton, consumed in Northampton, and will continue to be done in Northampton. So I don't think there's any question about that at all. Question number 28. <coughs> what other <coughs> examples ex exist around New England for a community farm? Well, we had a wonderful presentation <coughs> at one of our uh, recent uh, Ag Commission meetings about a, a community farm that had uh, uh, been uh, undertaken up in Williamstown. And it's a tremendous uh, success. Uh, there was a lot of advocates both within the, the town of Williamstown. Uh, and the big plus on this one was the fact that the, the people who own the land were willing to work with uh, all kinds of uh, people city <coughs> trust to try to put together uh, and maintain this land in agriculture. And I think that was a perfect storm in a good way. And uh, I think it was a wonderful presentation. There's a lot of possibilities out there for that. Uh, there's another one, I believe, up in the Burlington, Vermont area. And I know there are more around here uh, in, in, in Massachusetts, maybe a little bit more towards the eastern part of the state, we were given a, a part of that presentation, um, uh, showed us a farm. Uh, I'm not quite sure what town it was, uh, but it was in the eastern part of the state. I'm sorry, I can't remember the town, uh, but it was all quite successful. So uh, it's, there's really a lot out there that could be done. But again, uh, in those cases, a lot of the, the help really to get the thing off the ground was by the uh, by the uh, people who own the land. And uh, it's a little hard, a little different situation here. I don't want to take too much time. I just got a couple more here. Um, <clears throat> who will actually manage the agricultural land? Uh, we can't do that as an Ag Commission, I believe. Uh, currently, it would be the Recreation and Conservation Commission who really have uh, jurisdiction over that. Our mission is to promote and encourage agriculture in every way that we think we can. Uh, so as far as that question goes, I believe uh, that's where that would go. Uh, agricultural education, question number 44, is one of the fastest growing academic areas for achieving positive academic results. Agreed. And I think this uh, bean property could be a very good possibility for working with children, with young adults, with whoever, to use agricultural education as part of the uh, process up there. So yes, I think that's a very positive thing and it very potentially could be done. Uh, question number 52, what are the implications of former toxins uh, being, <coughs> excuse me, an orchard? Uh, for either rec for agriculture or recreation use. Uh, that question should be answered on January 13th. Uh, there will be a toxicology report coming back 
Uh, and uh, I think that's going to be of interest. So we'll be watching that closely. Question number 72. <clears throat> Have you explored partnering with, partnering with a land trust that specializes farmland protection to secure the bean farm. We have heard about this, as I said, with these presentations that we had. Uh, it's a little bit in a, it's a little tough thing to do right now because the process is moving quickly and we can't move that fast, I don't think, with a land trust. Uh, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the future, but in this particular situation, from what I've uh, listened and what I've learned on the task force, uh, it, it's a little tough right now to do that. And question number 74, <clears throat> um, according to Rick Chandler of the state ATR program at the city where a land trust could convince neighboring owner Wayne Goulet to put a similar amount of his land into ATR at the same time we protect the bean farm, both the bean farm and the olive farm could get more than the standard uh, $10,000 an acre for preserving their land under ATR. Is this being considered and or coordinated? And the answer to that is yes. So thank you very much. And uh, I've tried to answer some of the questions that the audience and people participated uh, in on the December 7th forum. I hope that has helped with you. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to take one second to recognize some city councilors that are here. Mary Ann LaBarge. Uh, from Ward 6 is here somewhere, and Jesse Adams, the elected council, council at large, is here. Anybody else? Okay, and uh, now uh, if you've had a chance to breathe, take a breather. Mr. Okay. Kevin Lake again, chair of the Conservation Commission. So the charter of the Conservation Commission includes the protection of open space. Uh, largely, our, our primary tools have to do with the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the City Wetlands Ordinance, but we're also charged with the responsibility for protecting the open space, which is why, as Rich said, we have some farmland that we then lease to, to farmers that we're a body that has the ability to be assigned uh, a responsibility for uh, worrying about and taking care of uh, city open space. Um, in the case of the, the bean farm, there are some um, limits in areas where uh, certain things any use would have to be restricted. Um, along the, the river, this is the Mill River, um, the uh, uh, Rivers Act says to uh, the riparian zone, 200 uh, feet from uh, the uh, river's edge, is protected land. It's a, basically a no disturb zone. There is an area um, that would be grandfathered closer to about 100 feet, um, but otherwise, um, that would be protected conservation land. There's also a wetland um, down here, um, and uh, there, in addition to the wetland itself, there would be a buffer area, and within that buffer and the wetland, there would be a no disturb zone as well. So there's certain clear areas of uh, uh, no disturbance that um, we would be responsible uh, for enforcing um, in the Conservation Commission. Um, in addition to that, uh, we would be the, the group worrying about, for instance, what is the balance? And it becomes a judgment question when you're deciding between public goods that are, uh, it's not a good and a bad, it's, it, it's more than one public good. But what is the balance between um, the improved habitat represented by uh, uh, open space used as agriculture uh, rather than the relatively degraded habitat of uh, recreational fields? And so we would also be um, as we uh, do this research, we'll be worrying about those variables. Um, we looked at a, a few questions um, as critical in terms of going forward. This is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of questions before final recommendation would come out that we would want to do more deeply research. But um, a few that uh, early on are important to us are, uh, is it necessary to determine the ultimate use in order to purchase the land? And the answer to that is, no, it's not necessary. Um, we, in fact, the, the three commissions and um, increasingly the, the sense of the task force is to recommend to the city council, by all means, let's not let this opportunity slip away. Um, this land 
in the last real estate market would have been far more than the price we're uh, uh, thinking of paying for it now. And whenever the real estate market comes back, it will be again. If we miss this window, um, then somebody's going to put a couple of dozen homes on this land and nobody's going to benefit in the way that we're talking about here. So we are pretty enthusiastic about uh, saying, let's not worry about whether we have every uh, um, position of every possible playing field or uh, any other description of the specific use decided. Let's make sure we don't miss the opportunity. Um, next uh, important question, um, what are the funding sources? Well, in fact, there's a, a, a list of funding sources that can be used. It's important to understand um, that uh, if we were to say that this was going to be a mixed use um, a parcel and that there's going to be development costs for any recreational field, then until that development money is found, um, probably through state and federal grants, um, it would not be out of general funds <coughs> from the city. Not, uh, uh, the, until that uh, development money would be found, the land would remain in agricultural um, use. Um, it's also uh, important to recognize that um, active recreation and um, passive recreation, including community gardens, which was uh, always a part of the recreation uh, committee's uh, th commission's thinking about how this land might be used, uh, as community gardens, um, that uh, there are competitive grant um, uh, grants offered by the state uh, for up to 66% of the value. Uh, there is agricultural preservation funding um, also from the state. Uh, there are several foundations and other uh, uh, grant sources that exist that could provide small grants, both local um, and regional. Um, users, uh, if it were uh, rented as farmland or uh, as recreational uh, field, uh, use fees uh, would be charged. So there'd be a, a number of sources. This is some of the stuff that eventually needs to get brought down to a level of detail, but at this early stage, just identifying that yes, there are a lot of sources, uh, this would not come out of general funds for the city, uh, I think is enough to say, okay, do we get to a point where there's a go, no go threshold, and, and our general sense is yes, this, we know enough to know that there would be resources out there and it wouldn't come out of the city coffers. Uh, chemical history of the land, um, as uh, Rich said, we, we are uh, waiting a toxicology report to we'll understand that that could be important for any use. Um, it seems most uh, likely that the uh, area that had previously been used as a, uh, an orchard uh, which is up in the uh, northeast area, is the area that will probably uh, have most restricted use so if there is found to be um, stuff in the ground that uh, leafy or root vegetables couldn't handle, for instance, or that you wouldn't want kids playing on. Um, yeah, but th that's uh, to be seen. That, that research is underway. Um, are there solutions to wet areas? Well. If it's a wetland, it's a wetland, and there are tests that will um, indicate whether the kinds of soils and the movement of water through those soils <coughs> indicate that this is a wetland. And if it's a wetland, then it's a no disturb area and you can't put anything there. Um, uh, certain grandfathered uses are occasionally allowed, but for the most part you can't do anything with it. Um, in fact, we believe that the only real wetland is fairly localized and the riverfront. Um, and in terms of the other questions, if there's soils that just happen to be wet at different times of the year, um, can there be uh, a, a way to remedy that? And that, that then becomes a, an expense question. Yes, uh, it can be remedied, uh, but what you would have to do for drainage or to bring in sand or whatever, it makes the development for recreational purposes uh, more expensive. It also makes uh, certain agricultural uses more difficult. Um, Uh, there was concern about uh, possible redefinition of uh, floodplain uh, that had come out of public meeting in this room a couple of weeks back. And uh, I think the most important part of the answer is that um, the regulatory floodplain um, under the State Building Code, the Wetlands Protection Act, and federal regulations 
uh, which is the 100-year floodplain, will not change. We, th that's not something that we can uh, change arbitrarily and it wouldn't be changed in, in any way. Um, uh, the uh, uh, majority of the site is, in fact, not in a floodplain. Um, the, uh, there's one map, I don't know if we have it here, there's uh, federally mapped FEMA lines on it. I don't see it here. Um, it shows, yes, there is a small part of, uh, of that's in the floodplain, but not most of the land. Um, uh, talking about, uh, as Rich brought up, weighing the conservation value um, uh, of recreational fields versus farmland. Uh, the Conservation Commission recognizes that uh, uh, agricultural habitat next to uh, the uh, uh, wildlife habitat is, is far preferable to uh, rec fields. Um, we're trying to wrestle with what's the right balance, what are the necessary distances, and all that sort of stuff. But it, it's a recognized issue. We don't have an answer to it yet. Uh, what is the comprehensive plan for recreation usage of land citywide? Um, that, in fact, is the Northampton Open Space and Recreation Plan for 2005-2010. A new version of that plan is going to be developed uh, during this year. Um, the current plan expires uh, at the end of this year, and uh, up the Conservation Commission, among other groups, will be party to uh, writing the new plan. Um, how will future meetings and communications um, for abutters and neighbors be communicated so that everybody knows about it? Um, we haven't answered that question specifically yet, but that is one of the questions that we've identified. Uh, we know for general purposes things are going to be on the website, um, but the, the City Council in structuring this group uh, wanted different points of view recognized and the neighborhood point of view was to be represented by the chair, uh, uh, Gene Tacey. Um, now how to uh, get all information proactively out to abutters and neighbors, we have not mechanically decided how best to do that yet, but it is an item that we recognize as needed. What website are you talking about? Pardon me? What website are you talking about? Oh, city website? Uh, it, it's, yeah, if you go to the city website, in, into the planning department, there's a whole uh, cluster of these farm materials. Gene? Thank you, Kevin. Um, and next is uh, Carol Bertrand from the Recreation Commission. Hi, I'm Carol Bertrand. I'm the Recreation Commission for 18 years. And in all of that time, we've been looking for land to put fields on. Um, I also want to tell you that I was a teacher in Northampton in the public schools for 33 years. In my last 10 years, <coughs> we're teaching social studies here at JFK. And one thing I taught to many of the students that I had was the importance of farmland in, in a historical con. Um, it, it, as a historical concept. Um, I know how important prime farmland is. And in a perfect world, the land that we find for our rec-related fields um, and, and active recreation activities would not be on prime farmland. But the reality is the only land available that is uh, reasonably affordable is on prime agricultural land. And that's, that's very sad to me when I'm wearing the teacher hat. On the other hand, with the 18 years on the Recreation Commission, knowing that our charge has been to look and to promote recreation in Northampton, I'm obliged to um, see both sides and be objective about this, of course. Um, in a perfect world, we'd have plenty of money We'd have plenty of land for everybody. In a perfect world, we'd be able to have a, a, a wonderful um, passive and active recreation uh, area that would include conservation areas um, that would be appropriate for, for children. Uh, we'd have picnic areas. We'd have walking areas. And we'd have plenty of playing fields. 
Um, unfortunately, that was the ideal. Um, that is not the reality. We're very much aware that we um, are going to need to compromise on this. So what we are looking for, instead of the six rectangular uh, multi-purpose fields that we would like to have, and we have um, uh, in other meetings in other years, we, that has, it's been documented that that is what the city can use. And two um, baseball fields, 60 to 75 foot baseball fields. We would love to have those. Um, in, also in this ideal uh, complex, um, I guess I, I hate to use that word because it, uh, people think there's going to be lights and all sorts of uh, concession stands and that isn't true of course for this. We're not thinking about that at all. Um, but there would be the con uh, community gardens. That was always part of our plan to have some kind of community gardens there to expand what has existed um, up in the uh, state hospital lands for years. Um, so the reality is that we are looking for um, a more um, <coughs> modified uh, plan that would include three to four um, soccer fields or multi-purpose fields, they really, they really are, um, and uh, one smaller 60 to, to uh, 75 foot baseball field. And that's the reality of what we're looking for. Not a huge uh, recreation area, but again, as the others have said, we are willing to work together to get something that works best for all of Northampton. <coughs> and we have worked um, in a very cooperative, collaborative way, I must say, um, that has us not against each other, but rather working together to do the best we can for Northampton. The task force has been very objective and respectful, and I certainly appreciate working with the expertise at this table as well as from the other commissions when we have met um, two or three times. Um, and, and the meetings have been um, respectful and we all seem to be able to work together well. That's important in this day and age. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have to get some expert opinion. We have to seek advice we have to get feedback from many people, <coughs> but we are confident that we can um, make a decision that fits uh, a lot of different groups um, that best benefits the citizens of Northampton. Um, I have um, written out the questions that related primarily to the recreation department needs um, that are, I pulled them from the questions that are on the website um, located in the, on the city webpage in the planning department. And I have, a, um, have written out the answers to them. These are most of the questions that were asked related to recreation. Um, and this also document will be posted at some point on the city's website. But um, I encourage you to uh, uh, keep an open mind and to let us work together and to um, let us continue to be res respectful of each other's ideals about what this land could be. The Bean Farm is needs to be purchased for all of Northampton and, and we all agree on that. So thank you. I will pass these sheets out. I want to wait because it's going to be noisy. I know from the teacher and me. Thanks. Thanks, <laughs> uh, Early on, they uh, had given me a map to look at. It was a map of the Bean property. And he said, well, how are you going to make this work? I didn't have a clue. I fooled around with it for about three days. And uh, then it was recommended that the Zoning uh, Revisions Committee uh, weigh in here. And... Uh, 
and here they are. It was, it was absolutely impossible for me. So then we have a fourth uh, commission uh, that's sitting in with us, and uh, they're more than welcome. So, uh, and this is Peter Flinker from the Zoning Revisions Committee. We got time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not officially on the Zoning Revisions Committee, but uh, I was nominated <laughs> along with uh, Donna Lilborn, we're both landscape architects uh, who have done this kind of planning before, and uh, so the Zoning uh, Revisions Committee kind of strong armed us into volunteering for this. Um, I'm a landscape architect and a, and a planner. Uh, I work with a firm called Dotson Associates up in Nashville. Um, been working there for over 20 years, and I've lived in Leeds for since 1987, so I'm pretty familiar with the area. Uh, we have three kids that have gone through the school system, still in the school system, um, soccer players and uh, softball players. I think I visited every field in the, in the uh, city over, over the time. I've seen the conditions and the needs there, uh, but we're also uh, backyard farmers and very aware of the need for growing our own food here in North Hampton. Uh, professionally, <coughs> we've worked on this kind of planning for multiple purposes on sites like this uh, a number of times. So uh, it's kind of fun to get to do it even though you're not getting paid. <laughs> um, it's even more fun when you're not getting paid. We, uh, we started out with maps that were created by the, uh, the planning department. You see two of them over on the wall there with the outline of the bean farm shown in bright green. Uh, also, uh, Kevin talked about the, the floodplain boundaries, and you can come up later and see where the floodplain is exactly. It's marked on these maps in the, in the hatching here. And so you see that the floodplain is mostly within three and 400 feet of the river itself, and 200 feet of that is also protected by the Riverfront Protection Act. Uh, so it's unlikely that anything is going to happen in any of the land along the river. And it's, it's probably not buildable anyway, and that's the reason it's covered with forest uh, right now, because it's traditionally too wet to farm or too steep. Uh, and that's from what limited I know uh, walking around the site and working on it this week. I think we can conclude that most of the areas that are wooded on the site are probably not uh, either useful for agriculture or for recreational fields. So for the total of the site, it's about 45 acres. And if you take away the wooded portion and the steep slopes and the floodplains and so on, you end up with about 28 acres of workable land that can either be used for agriculture or for ball fields. Um, and so the next question is, what can you fit on that 28 acres? Uh, I think back in December, uh, Wayne prepared a plan that showed the six or seven ball fields laid out on the site, and that's available, uh, I think, in a, in a PDF format as part of the presentation that's up on that website in the planning department, so you can look at what happens if you cover the, the whole site with ball fields. Obviously, you can also just leave the whole site in agriculture. So the question is, is it possible to combine the ball fields and the agriculture? What we've heard so far uh, is that probably to be a viable farm, it needs to be something at least around 20 acres of land uh, for a farmer to really make a go of it. And so we have that in the back of our mind. We also know that for recreational purposes, you can't just have one isolated field out by itself because it's really expensive to maintain. Uh, you have, still have to build a road and a parking lot to get there. And so you need some combination of fields to really make that be a practical um, usefulness. So to make this a little easier to understand, we <coughs> took the plans uh, that's just an aerial photograph and traced over that to show just a sort of a simplified map of what's going on on the site. Along the left hand side there you see the <coughs> street. Along the right hand side you see the Mill River. And this shows the boundary is not too clear, but you see there's the boundary 
between the bean farm and the Alarga <coughs> farm, which is the large area to the south, of course. And then the, the western boundary of the bean farm really follows the steep slopes, which is wooded here. And this is slopes pretty much between 50, 60, 70 percent, which you really can't build anything on. Um, and so I guess we look at that as a good thing is it creates a really strong boundary for the site and the separation of this lower part of the property from the upper land along Spring Street. <coughs> to the north uh, west is um, Fairway, Fairway Village. You see the, <coughs> the loop road for Fairway Village and the brown buildings that are there now. And this is part of the golf course. This is also part of the golf course up here. So that's pretty close to the upper portion of the bean farm. And then across the river, of course, here's the loop road of Look Park and the ball fields in the center of Look Park. So what we're trying to do is really understand what the context of the site is, um, and both in terms of potential impacts on the neighborhood and opportunities to connect this property to adjoining farmland, to adjoining conservation land, and to recreation across the river, and then of course to get access to it um, from Spring Street. As you know, the current access is down along the bottom here. <coughs> Oops. We'll zoom in a little bit. Here's the, the old farmhouse yes. down by the stand away from the thing. Yeah. Top of the So here's here's the existing uh, bean farmstead and the access as it is now. The road sort of curves in along the woods, as you know, if you visited it, and then comes up along the hedgerow there to access the back fields. This is uh, one of the existing barns that sits out in the field. And there's another small barn that sits next to uh, the pond, which is in that location. So that's the site as it is now. And we looked at three different possibilities for the layout of fields. Um, the first one is to bring the road in pretty much where it is now, come down by the pond and have a parking lot uh, for about 100 cars next to the pond. And then you could have two full-size multi-purpose fields and a uh, softball or a little league baseball diamond in the back. And that uh, fits pretty well at one edge of uh, this existing hedgerow and, and woods. So there wouldn't be any additional clearing that really would be required. And it would make it pretty easy to contain the recreational activities and separate them from the, uh, the farming activities. In this case, there's enough left over land. I think uh, about 19 acres would be left for the agriculture all on this side. And if you include the steeper part up by the entrance, it would be closer to 20 acres, or maybe even 21. Does that include parking? That includes parking, yes. Uh, this is another option which has a shorter entrance road and the parking closer to the street, which of course yes, saves some uh, construction costs as well as doesn't require people to drive all the way through the site to get there. You would have to walk, uh, you know, five or six hundred feet to get down to a uh, ball field that could be down by the pond. And then this also has room for two full-size multi-purpose fields. And then the existing barn could remain in this location and be used, you know, as a utility, uh, a utility shed, or whatever. But what's the access for the farmer then to this? Yeah. The farmer. Um, could come along the edge here as as the road does now and come through here, or could come along this side, something like that. So again, this is a pretty easy to build a fence that would separate the recreational uh, cluster from the farmland. In this case, uh, it's at least 20 acres would be left over, <coughs> maybe 21, and that would include most of the better farmland because this, this area is kind of a wet 
a wet meadow right now. What happens is the drainage sort of collects at the base of this whole hillside and runs very slowly off through the fields here and down through the center of the Alaric farm. Uh, so this pond is, it doesn't really drain, I think, unless you've got a good deal of flooding. I think the water just sort of sits in there and slowly percolates into the ground. But what that means is that this, uh, this field is kind of low and wet in the springtime, and probably to create ball fields there, you'd have to bring in some additional fill and maybe even put drain pipes underneath. This is the last uh, alternative we looked at, which is three multi-purpose fields uh, <coughs> using that same general location, but it extends a little bit further into the, uh, the agricultural area. But you, so that's about another two acres of ball fields there. So this would be, for the previous one, was about 20 and a half acres for farmland. This one would be between 17 and a half and 18 acres for the farm. But again, it, it sort of maintains the, uh, the recreational fields uh, at the entrance and then leaves uh, sort of the bulk of the land in the back for the, uh, the farming operation. So that's the, the three different plans that we looked at. I think the conclusion is it is possible to build a, a reasonable size recreational complex here and still have uh, 20 somewhere between 17 and a half and 20 and a half acres for a farm. And there's a lot of unknowns right now. There's gonna be a lot of work to really figure out what's possible. A big unknown is what the restrictions are for some of the, the wetlands. If that pond has to be, well, the pond does have to be protected. The question is how much of a setback do you need? Uh, another question is how much is it gonna to cost to build those ball fields if you have wet conditions, and so on. So in terms of the, the basic slopes of the land and the available space, uh, this, these different options all work. Uh, yes? I, I know we're probably not supposed to ask any questions, but this is all best case scenario if there are no pesticides on the fields. What if there's pesticides on the fields? What are you guys gonna do? I think as, was mentioned earlier, the orchard area is back here, the former orchard, and that's probably the most likely to contain any kind of soil contamination, which would limit uh, the use of it for row crops and vegetables, uh, but it might allow other kinds of agricultural use. But that's certainly, that's something that uh, has to be looked at, and the report is gonna be available. 13th, it should be, the, the, the test results are due tomorrow. Right, so if there are pesticides, all that's being impacted is the amount of agricultural land that's going to be available, not the amount of land that will be available for fields. No, no, so don't, 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 don't get ahead, please. This, well, I'm just we, asking. we ask the land use folks to look at possibilities. None of these are plans. These, right. are, these are just uh, beginning thinking. Yeah, it's just what fits. And I think what we're doing now is, I think we hope collectively, and the questions that were asked last month were very helpful. I mean, this is sort of what we sometimes call shared fact-finding. So we're working together to figure out what do we need to know to make a good plan for this property. So this is just a, a quick sort of spatial layout of what fits. And then this raises a lot of questions as well. So if you're really going to build a road there, what are the implications of that? If you're really going to build a parking lot for 100 cars, how do you do that? Uh, should it be gravel? Should it be paved? If you're going to be having uh, fields there, what kind of support do you need in terms of fencing and plantings and landscaping? All those questions come later, but we're starting at sort of this basic uh, spatial layout to help figure out what do we need to know to make uh, a good final plan. Yep. Where might you suggest um, a, a farmer's house might be built? Oh, like with this uh, plan or, or one of the two former ones? And also, is that pond an agricultural pond right now? Uh, this pond here is a farm pond. It is a farm pond. There is no, there's, there's nothing in the plan for a house anywhere in the field. Yeah, I know right now, and I'm curious if, if, if um, you have an idea about where it might be an appropriate place given um, all the... In the purchase and sale agreement, 
that Bean has a restriction on there that there will be no houses built in the field. No houses will be built in the field. That's it, that's in the purchase and sale agreement. Okay, could you point out where the, the four lots that the city is thinking of selling off are in relation to this picture right now? Right in this area here. Yeah, the, the lots that are potentially developable along existing road frontage are right here. Uh, though this is a pretty steep hill, something like 15, 20% slopes. So there would be houses that would cost extra to build, uh, even if you didn't have to deal with ledge, which is a possibility there as well. Uh, but it would be possible to, to build a house, and it's just a matter of the expense. Where's Meadow Street on this map? Uh, Meadow Street is just off the bottom it of it. It is on the map. It's by the right. Well, what's the land on the other side of Meadow Street? It's a farm area there. It's also Allard Farms. Farms. Okay. That would have been easier. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this plan shows, well, just down here is where Meadow Street crosses. And so this is the bulk of the Allard Farm that's north of Meadow Street. And then, of course, there's more to the south. Yes. Um, in, in your scenario two and three, um, you have a field, a playing field on top of the existing barn. And I'm wondering if there is, um, if that barn is deemed to store. Do you know? I do not know. And um, I think this scenario leaves the barn where it is, the one with two multi-purpose fields, and then the last one uh, replaces it. So. I think it's certainly possible to work around that barn and maybe it be <coughs> save and use as part of the agricultural operation. Yes, ma'am. Was there any consideration made towards the possibility of not not specifically maximizing field or maximizing farm, but actually trying to make those two spaces interact a little bit more? Because right now they seem very segregated. And personally, I thought one of the beautiful things about sharing the space would be that having a farm with agricultural things going on and having playing fields, there would be people who would come for the sports and then would get the experience of being, you know, out in agriculture, as opposed to what I see here is very, very segregated, and I think it loses a lot of the potential growth um, for kind of those two lines mingling and, and enjoying two sides of the fence, if I could say that. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> the quick, quick answer is we're sort of starting just with, as I said, with sort of spatial layout and using sort of best, best common practices, which mean that you try to concentrate the areas that are being maintained by one entity. So to have all the farmland together makes it easier for the farmer to deal with it. All right, the, uh, the, the first name that I have on the list is Iman. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone that we can use here? I'll give you this one. I don't need it. <laughs> Yeah. I'm Yvonne Mitchell, I live on Jackson Street in the Ward 1A, but I'm still interested in land. And I would like Mr. Lane to have that lovely scenario, yeah, that, uh, that time chart put on the, uh, the official website, because I have been seeing, I've lived here since 1956, and I have seen all of these people show up after we've decided on something and say, I never heard of it. We haven't had a meeting. We've had six meetings, seven meetings, eight meetings. So could you please make a box with the dates on it that all these meetings are taking place so at the end, when we decide on something, people aren't going to say, I never heard of it. Okay? Now, the other thing I'd like to say is, I really can't decide on ball fields and recreation, oh, I'm very divided. But one thing I know is, I want you to buy that land. The, the, the thing is, the deadline is February 5th. I don't want to see houses on there. I don't want to see, go for things like that, 
Okay, so could you please get to it and have <laughs> us buy this land before something dreadful happens to it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That is a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis Biddle. I live on Forbes Avenue in, uh, in, in Ward 2, and I want to join others in thanking the, the members of the task force for all the hard work that they're doing. Well, you think you've done a lot of work, but there's a lot more to come, obviously. <laughs> I appreciate that and the commission work uh, behind it. Uh, I'm a member of the Zoning Revisions Committee, uh, and I've, I served on the steering committee for Sustainable Northampton, so, so all these issues sort of tied. Tie in. I'm sorry, tie in in a, in, a, in a really significant way to the work of Sustainable Northampton over the years and the work of Zoning Revisions now. But I'm here tonight uh, really wearing two other hats. Um, I spent about uh, 11 years of my career uh, as, a, as a farmland protection guy. I am a farmland protection guy, but I, was a, I worked at American Farm as their national uh, director of land protection, so I had an opportunity to work with uh, communities all around the country uh, saving farms, uh, including here in Northampton. I had a chance to work with the city and Mass Audubon on, uh, on <coughs> the, the, the Burt Farm down in, uh, down in the Meadows for a combination of expanded uh, Arcadia Sanctuary uh, and, uh, and, and, and working farmland. But, I, but I'm also uh, pleased to be the, the, the founder of Northampton High Crew. I've been involved in, in uh, youth recreation and, and athletic activities for basically the time that I've been here in Northampton. And quite, uh, quite proud, a lot, along with a lot of other families, to have uh, developed a, a program that is now one of the largest uh, uh, varsity sports at the high school. It's probably served over a thousand kids in their families, high school kids and JFK kids, over that, over that period of time. So I've become very much uh, aware of the, uh, of the role of, of youth athletics in shaping the, the bodies and the minds and the leadership skills of, uh, of, of our kids and the impact it's had on larger communities. So I'm, I'm, uh, in, in, in some ways torn, I suppose, between those, those, the, those two roles, although I must, uh, I must say that despite my farmland protection background, I come down on the side of the significance of this opportunity for recreational fields. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in protecting the right farms in the right places. Uh, and I think even the folks at American Farmland Trust and, uh, and Land Trust would acknowledge you can't save all the land. You can't save all the farmland. So it's important to be strategic about it. It's important to think about where we want to save our farmland, where we want our recreational opportunities. And for me, uh, though I'm delighted to see a number of compromise scenarios, I would hope that the preponderance of uses uh, on this property are for are for recreation. I think that's uh, I think that's really what would add most to the quality of life in our in our community. I'm a I'm a real local food guy and a local agriculture <coughs> guy. So for me, local agriculture <coughs> means pressuring stop and shop to and, and big Y to buy more local products. It means working with uh, with CESA, it means joining CSA farms, it's doing all of those things that promote local agriculture. But local agriculture doesn't mean necessarily that you have to protect every acre of farmland right in Northampton. It means to think more and more regionally about it. So I come down on the side of being a local agriculture enthusiast who thinks that uh, we should have a, a good dose of recreational fields on this, on this, on this property. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Osberg, please. Howdy, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Osberg, 48 Greenleaf Drive here in Florence. Um, I'm here as a parent, a coach, and also a 46 year resident of the community, and I'm also the president of the uh, Northampton Keller Youth Baseball League. We serve about 140 kids. We're four years in existence, and we're combined with other uh, rec programs, there are probably 700 or so kids playing baseball in the community. Uh, on behalf of the families that we serve, uh, one, I'm encouraging the purchase of the property, and two, I'm encouraging recreational use. Um, baseball is unique, and, and that's really what I want to focus on. Um, we need space. Um, foul balls present a danger. Uh, poor playing conditions, and we have really poor playing conditions because of overuse. Two of the 60-foot, of the seven 60-foot diamonds that are available 
probably would better qualify for uh, 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 something else other than baseball field because they're underwater half the time. Uh, they're probably uh, uh, wetlands in the, at uh, JFK at, uh, up at Ryan Road and down at Sheldon Field. If you drive by, you see it's wet all the time. A big problem that we face because of the overuse are um, really bumpy playing conditions, which compromise safety. Uh, safety is further compromised by the fact that we're jammed in and, and players are always looking for places to play and there's balls are spreading all over the place that presents a hazard. Um, the safety issues are real, the overuse issues are real, they're well documented, our kids are frustrated, our coaches are frustrated, uh, there's many more kids that want to play than we have space and so I would really encourage use for recreational purposes and recognize that there's some safety issues now associated um, with the, uh, the limits that we have. Uh, as far as maintenance goes, just, just know that we're an enthusiastic group and a public-private partnership is going to be necessary and we're as committed to uh, pristine ball fields, I think, as many are uh, committed to bountiful harvest. So thank you very much. Jim Durfer, please. <coughs> hey, Rob, what ward are you in? Six. Six. Uh, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jim Durfer. I live in uh, Ward 6B on uh, West Parsons Lane. And I just wanted to uh, uh, bring up, a, I guess, a, a small personal example of what happens with the overcrowding of fields that we have here in, uh, in Northampton. Is that our, our fields are so used, you know, so competitive for usage that there is absolutely zero room for error in scheduling. And so here's an example of what happens when the fields get pressured so much. Uh, early September, I had scheduled a number of practices before the start of our fall soccer season. So Monday night, I get all my kids, I meet them for the first time to go take the field, and there's another game already on my scheduled field. Um, for the, another soccer team. So I, I, I called the rec department and said, hey, uh, we had a double booking. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. You know, fortunately, it was our first practice. So I kind of took them off into the side um, and we waited for that game to finish and then we got about 50 minutes of real practice time. <laughs> the following Wednesday, I go to have another practice and finally I'm gonna get to show these kids who've never even played soccer what a soccer field looks like, and wouldn't you know it, there's another game on the field that's just about to start. And so I was put into the unenviable position to have to go up to these coaches, you know, which one of the teams was visiting another Northampton team from Granby and tell them that I'm sorry is that I have this field scheduled and that unfortunately you're going to have to take your game someplace else. As a matter of fact, you're gonna to have to cancel it because there is nowhere else to play tonight. Now, you know, a little story, but imagine the uncomfortable feeling I had having to go, you know, to those two coaches and tell them, hey, I've got to teach my kids too. And you, you know, there's no room at the end. And so I'm talking to my Northampton neighbors looking at the daughters of my Northampton friends and who go to school with my son and tell them, guess what? You can't play tonight because there's, there's no schedule, you know, there's no room in the schedule for everybody to play at the same time. And, and so this is just one small story of what happens a number of times during the season because it's, the scheduling has to be perfect and with rain dates and et cetera, there's no slack. We have no slack, you know, to practice or even to make up games. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Cohen. Uh, I'm Eric Cohen. I live here in Florence. Uh, first of all, of course, please buy the land, whatever the details are. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of agricultural use, but I don't think that agricultural use means saying, you know, okay, suck it up, kids. Um, <laughs> sports are a great way to be healthy and to be outside and for all 
all our kids. Um, but being involved in growing and learning about local food is also a great opportunity. And so what I would beg the committee to do is to look into possibilities for agricultural use with a commitment to a public educational role. We have great resources locally. We have um, there's folks with an educational farm up at Redgate. We've got <coughs> great 4-H groups um, right here headquartered at, New at UMass Amherst. <coughs> We've got all the local farmers and local CSAs. We've got Smith Vocational, which is famous for its agricultural program and could maybe extend that mission to uh, younger kids helping out set up a program. So I would love to see an exploration of ways to keep this land agricultural, but with a mission to serve Northampton and <coughs> its kids. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dean Clapp. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Lily Lombard and all of the folks who right at the very beginning were really excited about this and sort of brought attention to all of this. I think it's really wonderful to see so many people coming out, read the forums, and see how respectful everybody has been about this issue. Um, I actually have a son who grew up playing soccer, and the only game he follows on TV and reads about is soccer. But sorry, honey, I'm totally behind the agricultural <laughs> use of this property. Um, I think it's really imperative that we protect property when this opportunity arises. We're not growing more of land. It is a rare, rare commodity and it's imperative that we use this property very, very well. I also just want to <coughs> say, I'm a little concerned with seeing the number six on the yellow sheet, which is where is the money going to come from, and that the CPA money could be used. I think it's important that CPA be used for some of this property, but not for all of it. Um, that CPA money is so rare and so important in this community, and so many people are asking for funds, and there's never enough to go around. So I just want to make sure that we spread the wealth where it's <coughs> available. And finally, I thought that comment about never knowing what's happening is really important. And I would just like to share that there is another meeting this in this room on January 20th concerning another issue in town. It's about the um, preservation of the dam on Chesterfield Road. And if people are interested in saving that dam and not seeing it ripped out, please come and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, William Meyer? I, my, answer, uh, my question was answered earlier. Okay. Lily Lombard. Thank you. Well, I'm probably one of those rare people that took a moment to go to the website and read all of the partial responses to the questions. So I am going to take a moment to give my feedback on some of these questions that I think that might be most helpful to you. Um, one, of the, one of the things I read was, and, and this came the yellow sheet too, was that um, money can come to, to purchase and develop recreational fields from state and federal grants. And I want to um, pose a question whether that is possible. Um, there's an executive order by the state called Executive Order 193 and it's pertaining to agricultural protection. And it, it says, I won't read the whole thing, but I will just um, point to the, to the most germane um, parts and that is um, that the, the governor of the time said, I do hereby order and direct all relevant state agencies to seek to mitigate against the conversion of state-owned agricultural land and adopt the policies herewith. Number one, state funds and federal grants administered by the state shall not be used to encourage the conversion of agricultural land to other uses when feasible alternatives are available. And it defines agricultural land as, um, I'm sorry, it defines state-owned land as all lands purchased in whole or in part with state funds or federal funds administered by the state. So um, based on that, I do not believe that Northampton can qualify to purchase or develop this land for recreation because it is agricultural land that is an active agricultural use. So I think that needs to be taken off um, from the table. I also think that um, there's, there's another issue, and that is that the state um, self-help grants, so-called self-help grants, grants to buy land for um, conservation or parks, um, have a basic qualification that the land has to be open to the general public. And from what everything I've heard, 
At the last forum, we wanted to restrict access just to local residents because we are concerned about the island road effect of having folks come from out of state to use our, our um, fields and have the same kind of traffic you know, uh, onslaught that we had before. So we would not qualify for, for a state grant that limits access to um, local residents. So that's my first comment. Um, there is there is comment. Uh, there's one question that asks about um, parking, and it asks: Has the town approached the Allard Farm owners and offered to buy a parcel to create parking areas that are less disruptive to the neighborhood? And the partial response is: The city will look at the Allard property if it is available. I just want to remind us that the Allard property is also prime agricultural land, and we're no better off converting that to parking than we are to the bean farm. So um, I, I throw that out as a caution. Um, so uh, it, it was nice to hear that the Conservation Commission um, does acknowledge that there's um, greater habitat value in agricultural land than in recreational fields. Um, I did bring some literature that um, for, for the entire task force to look over um, to also sort of uh, support that. Um, there, there was a question about uh, the pros and cons of centralized versus distributed recreational fields. And the partial response was that centralized fields have less expensive infrastructure costs per field. They're easier to manage. Um, they, are allow, they allow folks to go to one place, travel easier, mowing and maintenance can be accomplished more efficiently. And the pros of a decentralized, decentralized recreational fields are that they serve pickup games and distribute impact over a wider area. I'd like to add two points um, to potential pros for having decentralized um, recreational fields. And that is, one is I think that they can serve our neighborhoods better. And they can be adopted and, and really be owned by neighborhoods. And I think we're more and more acknowledging um, the value of localization at all levels. And so that's one. And the other is that I think that um, decentralizing our recreational fields will mean that we'll have more options in the real estate market. We won't be constrained saying this is, you know, this is it. This is our only opportunity for rec fields because we want to build a complex. If we, if we get beyond that paradigm, I think we'll have a lot more options. Four minutes now. Okay. I was supposed to cut you off at two, and we got about 25 more names here. All right. Um, there, uh, I, I would just, okay, let me, let me streamline then. In other words, in other words I've got to In other words, I can stop. I don't have, any, I don't have, no, cho I have no choice. Thank you very much. Uh, Garson Fields. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Garson Fields. I live on Kennedy Road in uh, Ward 7B. Uh, and I am here tonight to talk as a, uh, the voice of caution. Uh, what we're talking about, first of all, I think it's very interesting that the, that the planning board isn't represented here tonight because it appears that this whole project uh, found its, its uh, beginning at the, at the uh, planning board. Um, what we're talking about here is not just uh, the acquisition of a piece of uh, property with potential with a lot of different potential. We're talking about uh, uh, strapping our children and our grandchildren with ongoing costs uh, for which it appears there's been no uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and I keep hearing the let's not worry uh, theory, but in fact, uh, we all have to take a look at our children and grandchildren and ask ourselves whether we're going to do the right thing. We don't live in an isolated planet. We have surrounded communities like Hadley and Hatfield that have wonderful uh, property that, that could be jointly developed into recreational facilities. Um, there, there are so many uh, what I would call omissions of convenience in this conversation that it's, it's uh, absolutely staggering. Uh, I, I would uh, like to see a farmer that, that is going to tell me that they can make a living on 20 acres of land. Uh, there's been no discussion of handicapped accessibility. Uh, you have uh, 
potentially the planning board apparently has discussed putting a bridge across the river there. What's the purpose of, of uh, making the, a bridge access to, to this piece of property? Uh, you know, what's it all about? And if in fact there, uh, there's been, uh, everything's been done in the light of day, has anyone seen the document that has secured the agreement between the Bean family and the city of Northampton? And who has been yes. authorized? Yes. Pardon? It's online. Okay. Uh, it wasn't there when I looked at it before. Who was authorized, and when were they authorized to negotiate that? Oh, a long time ago. Uh, that's not an answer. Yeah. Who is it? When? So anyway, I just I would just urge everyone to, to think about this because we do have other opportunities. This is not the only place where we could do this. If, in fact, what the fire department, uh, the fire station location committee told us was the center of the population in Northampton, it's closer to Route 91. And, and if half of these teams are going to be coming from outside of the area, doesn't it make sense to have uh, greater access to Route 91 so that uh, we can convenience everybody and rather than having them burn up a lot of fuel getting to an isolated area in Northampton. So uh, with that said, I'm not necessarily for or against the, uh, the purchase of this property, but I think that, that there are a lot of uh, issues that, that really should be hashed out. And if we have until February 15th to do that, we have to, it's obviously not going to happen. But the conversation should include all these different issues. Thank you. In Kingston? Kaplan? Maybe. Thank you. That's it? Possibly. <laughs> right like me. I wrote it really <laughs> fast. Really fast. Dan Kaplan from Amherst, Mass. Are you allowed to talk if you're from Amherst, Mass here? Yes. yes. Is that right? Go right ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm from Amherst. I don't have to be involved in actually making a decision on any of these things. It sounds like you have uh, some uh, lots of competing interests. Um, I just wanted to come to um, add my experience to the mix. I'll give it to you in uh, one minute and 43 more seconds. Um, I do have two children who play soccer. They love soccer fields. I'm also um, the manager of Brookfield Farm in Amherst, Mass, where we have a CSA which has um, uh, about 30 acres of vegetables that they grow. Uh, we've been able to have a viable farm business on those 30 acres. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the number of 20 acres came from in terms of the viability for any farm. We certainly felt that um, with our operation that we didn't achieve uh, economic stability until we got much closer to 30. Um, I also wanted to just share that our farm was originally uh, APR'd by the town of Amherst. It was eventually uh, owned by a nonprofit trust I'm a manager of the farm, I don't own the farm, and um, none of that has stopped us from having a successful operation. Uh, I also wanted to bring the news from across the river that uh, business is booming in the CSA community farm world. Uh, I would never consider a farm like this to be a competitor to what we're doing. Um, we have 500 members of our farm, and there is currently a waiting list of almost 600 people to become members of the farm. Uh, those numbers increase almost 20% a year, and we don't see any sign of them changing. So uh, we would love to see many more community farms so that when people call us and ask if they can get a share <coughs> some vegetables, we don't just have to tell them, no, I'm sorry, there's just no more organic vegetables for you. <laughs> uh, we think this is a strange and ridiculous situation that we found ourselves in. We have a limited amount of organic produce for people. But um, we have been able to make a living doing what we're doing, not by owning what we're doing, but by actually managing it. And uh, would be happy to assist in any way to give any more information on your fact finding that you would like. Thank you. John Lind. John Lind. I knew you were back there. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize there was going to be this much discussion on various things. So, 
uh, who am I? I'm John Lind. I live on Bryan Road in Florence. I have uh, lived and worked on several farms during my lifetime. One in Massachusetts here, big cow farm. Uh, one a potato farm down in Long Island. Uh, up until a year ago, I was a, had a building contractor's license from the town of East Hampton in Long Island. I only bring that up because uh, uh, <clears throat> I actually spent most of the summer in Southampton, Long Island. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you go down there, there's 30 and 40 million dollar mansions and right on the side of them are cornfields. And they're spread out throughout all of that community. Um, there is no Northampton, Long Island, by the way. But uh, <clears throat> the reason I bring that up is that I just, I look at this uh, particular uh, situation and, and I'm, I have a lot of questions, uh, I feel, uh, and, and unfortunately I see no one from the CPA here tonight and no one from the planning board because I had questions I directly wanted to ask them. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first thing is, uh, I've attended all the meetings um, and uh, I've heard too many different numbers, for example, 47 acres, 41 acres was one report I saw at one point, 45 is sort of what the standard is right now. And if you divide the $910,000 by 45, it comes to 20,200 and something dollars and change per acre, which is a lot more money than farm, farmland ought to cost or recreational fields ought to cost, uh, especially considering that they're for the good of the community. So that's, that's one question I, I kind of wanted to ask somebody from the planning board or, the, or uh, and the CPA as in regards to where the money would come from from them. Um, the other thing is, uh, it was brought up at that very first meeting at, at Smith Vocational High School, which was reported in the paper as having been at JFK uh, on December 1st. And, and in that meeting, I think the question was asked of uh, Mr. Parent, uh, how much did it cost to develop the uh, soccer field up at the state lands? And he corrected that and said it was a multi-use field and it was two ball fields. And the number was $500,000 to develop those fields. And so when we look at the $910,000 as a purchase price, we have to keep in, in our minds that there's going to be a lot more costs involved, not only in the development of this, but in the, the future maintenance and upkeep of this um, purchase. So that, that's something I wanted to ask as well, and, and unfortunately nobody's here to answer that. But um, the other thing I noticed too was, um, and I have a concern about this, is, is the conservation land. And, and I'm looking at this map, and I, I remember that the first meeting, I think the discussion was about the fact that, indeed, with uh, orchards, uh, there, there's uh, the possibility of arsenic, I believe, is the, is the actual uh, toxin that might be in the ground and uh, uh, put on uh, fruit trees. And uh, a few years ago, well, 25 years ago, I was looking at a 180-acre orchard. A good friend of mine owned it, and uh, I was almost on the point of buying it. And uh, it fell through. My wife didn't want to do it. But the, the real issue here is that eventually I talked this fellow into going organic. And he turned 180 acres of apple fields up in Chesterfield into an organic uh, orchard. And, the, and sells the apples to, at the time it was a bread and circus, but now it's Whole Foods. Uh, so I know that it's very possible to take a piece of land that's got some kind of a hazardous material in the ground and, and convert it. And there is probably some documentation on how long it would take to turn uh, a piece of land that's been contaminated into organic uh, farmland. And I, I think that there are some people, uh, from what I've heard in this, in this audience as far as in, in all the meetings, it seems to me that a lot of people in Northampton have an organic bent on this. They're not looking to have this become a piece of uh, farmland that somebody's going to go in and farm and put down pesticides and all that kind of stuff. The other issue, can I, one more thing? The other issue too that was brought up is the fact that if the, and it was quite, well it's a two part, part question because I looked at this from, I think it was Wayne Fye that brought up the fact that there was somebody looking to develop 20 to 22 houses on the, on the portion, the 10 acres that was going to be used at the time that he was talking about it, dedicated to the recreation fields. And so I went back and did a little homework because the other question that was asked of Wayne was how 
when does the city break even and, and how, how, do, how do we take care of our services that we have to add on if somebody does develop those houses? And he said that the number was $400,000 a house. So I, I went back and did the arithmetic just to make sure I, I had it right in my head because uh, the 20 houses, using that number, 20 houses, you, you're looking at $8 million worth of real estate stock <coughs> added to the city. One more thing that's really going. Okay. So. okay. But it's important to know that any developer that develops a piece of property within the city is required to upgrade the services at his own expense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I hope I don't do this with you. Laura Bidot. How did I do? You did great. All right. Hi, I'm Laura Biddle. Um, I live on Warren Street, a couple blocks away, and um, we actually host a community garden in our yard. Um, and thank you, Dan. We're really enjoying our winter vegetables from your farm. Um, I think that one of the big points that people keep bringing about has to do with finances and how it is that our city is going to afford this land if we buy it, which I personally think we should buy it. But I think as a farm, we sort of can't go wrong. Um, that $500,000 should develop a field, that's a lot of money. It is an ongoing expense. But if anyone came out to the winter market this past weekend and tried to fight their way for a parking space in that parking lot, or try to get some lettuce, for heaven's sakes, you would see that the market for local, organic, fresh produce is just crazy. We want it, we want it to come from here, and it provides a source of revenue. That land will pay for itself. It will not be a burden to our city if we own it as a community farm. In addition to that, and I think this is a really big thing, if we have that farm as a community and we can open up that access for people, there are many, many folks who live in Northampton who are not at the winter market. And that is because they cannot afford to buy the produce that comes from here. They have to go to the stop and shop. They have to go to the big Y. They have to buy <coughs> the head of lettuce that's on sale for 99 cents. They have to buy stuff that's been trucked from across the country and on the other side of the world because that's been bargain purchased at some crazy price that is not the real cost of a piece of food. We need to open up local fresh food to everyone and it does not need to be an elitist product like it is right now. And I think owning this land and making it so that we can have CSA shares that are actually given out as a form of social service to those who are in need in our community is something that we haven't even considered and it is a wonderful way to tap this land. Thank you. Meg Taylor. Meg Taylor. We are an organization that designs and delivers food and farm programs for all ages and currently run the Farm and Garden Summer Camp over at Hampshire College Farm Center. Um, and I, of course, support this being uh, kept as agricultural land, but uh, what I wanted to say is that in my mind what makes a community farm truly successful and inclusive is the educational programming it offers. A CSA, or community gardens for that matter, are great at feeding people, but well-crafted programs where people of all ages are actively participating in food production and animal care leave lasting impressions and will change a person's life forever. <coughs> I can speak for myself on that too. Um, some of the programs my organization has found to be in demand for our market research is uh, in uh, Northampton and the Pioneer Valley in general, uh, with particularly in demand are farm-based preschools, uh, preschool programs, after-school animal chore programs, uh, summer, summer and vacation, uh, school vacation and farm camps, 
teacher training and adult weekend uh, <coughs> workshops. <coughs> and these would be things like uh, food preservation, canning, uh, chicken coop building, etc. These programs pr provide many of the benefits shared with team sports, physical exercise, fresh air, cooperative skills, they build some confidence, they teach hard work, teach children about hard work, um, but they also develop a sense of purpose for many people and uh, develop an understanding of biological processes as well as provide people with an uh, intimate relationship with food that nourishes them. In addition, in a more practical um, manner, uh, these programs provide child care, uh, which is also in demand in Northampton for those of you who have children. Um, and they also uh, complement uh, children's academic studies in, their, in school. Uh, the need for farm-based education is really here. It's in Northampton. Uh, residents are currently driving to Amherst uh, or the Hadley area to farm set. They don't necessarily feel connected to uh, for farm camp education experiences for their children. There's currently five summer farm camps uh, with waiting lists in the Amherst area. There are none in Northampton, which um, is shocking to me. Uh, in a town that values food, families, and farmland, there's no farm in Northampton that meets the need for high quality farm education programming. Most farmers that do farm in Northampton or anywhere for that matter, they don't have the time to provide these programs or maybe even the interest or expertise to do so. The Bean Farms locations is uh, situated perfectly uh, between several elementary schools, preschools, JFK here, uh, both high schools, and it's in the heart of family friendly Florence. How's that for alliteration? Uh, family friendly Florence and uh, makes it an ideal site for a community farm that in addition to growing food um, in the form of CSA or gardens offers authentic educational experiences that truly can deepen connections to plants, animals, people, and landscape that can nourish so many here. So I encourage the task force and the three commissions considering this land to look at some of the successful community farms uh, models particularly around urban areas. Uh, Native community organic farm I think is an incredible model and um, I, I know the director there personally and she's done wonderful things over her 30 some years there. Um, I've also worked at Shelburne Farms, Intervale Community Farm, uh, and Drumlin Farm as a farm educator. Those are also wonderful models. And I encourage the task force um, and the commission to realize the real value that ag education offers to the farm, the farmers, and the families and children that call Thank you. Rebecca Fletcher, please. Hi, I'm Rebecca Fletcher. And I live on Norwood Street here in Florence. And I wanted to introduce myself to those of you I haven't met yet um, in this Bean Project work. Um, I'm part of Bean Farm Advisory Board that's um, providing some support to the Agricultural Commission um, with any, any resources we can offer, um, Anne Kaplan, Meg Taylor, um, as well as several other <coughs> awesome people, Brent Grosscup from Northeast Organic Farming <coughs> Association, and um, Bill Corman from CSA, Chris Coffin from the American Farmland Trust. And I guess I just want to remind you again, if you don't know already, tell you that um, I would love to talk about help in any way, particularly um, I work for Equity Trust, um, a national nonprofit organization that helps uh, people in communities to protect farms with a focus on how, how will we own them, how will they be managed, how will they be stewarded, what gives us you know, the most food, what gives us the best um, uh, soil fertility, what, what gives us the best opportunities for education for our children. Um, in an agricultural setting, and um, and what meets a farmer's needs, so that they can make it a permanent home. Um, how can we get a farmer equity and the um, ability to operate with some autonomy and make decisions? Um, so, please call on me if you if you need, and um, I've got a couple <coughs> pieces of paper for you guys, so that you can know how to get in touch with me and a story about um, a farm that I love. Thank you. Okay. Cash today? Not even close. Oh, you know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tusi Gaston Gay. And um, I live in Florence on Willow Street, not too far from the Bean property. 
And I want to thank the task force for the wonderful work that you're doing and for the opportunity to speak here tonight. And I strongly support keeping the precious bee environment as a farm. And I'd like to offer another example of a viable, self-sustaining community farm, which someone already mentioned, the Natick Community Organic Farm. This is a nonprofit certified organic farm that is providing productive open space, farm products, and hands-on education for people of all ages. The farm um, took root with the, the Native School Committee leasing 27 acres of land to a project that was then established as a nonprofit organization called Native Community for Native Farms. And it, it involved basically it's real, a, big, a, big, a big purpose is uh, education. And it, it involves elementary, high school, college students, and the community in farming in uh, farm visits, they have vacation and after school programs for kids, <coughs> they have workshops, seminars, they have special farm events like maple sugaring tours, and they have a major fundraising event called the Annual Harvest Dinner and Silent Auction, which supports uh, the Teen Work Summer Program, where teenagers are able to actually work there for competitive wages and learn skills like carpentry, mechanics, gardening, and farming, obviously, and animal husbandry as well. Um, and learning how to help the environment and form healthy social relationships with their peers and with the adults. So this is, and the, the thing about this farm is it is self-sustaining. So not only can a CSA be self-sustaining, a community farm can be self-sustaining. And how they do that is they support themselves through grants, through member dues, through the sales of their products and through uh, their educational programs and various fundraising events. Um, so this, this is truly a community farm in every sense of the word. And I love that it involves um, the community in farming as well as in education. So some of the successes of a native community organic farm could be used here to create a self-sustaining community farm. I'm emphasizing the self-sustaining part, obviously. Uh, that would productively involve our youth and our entire Northampton community. And um, we need to be sustainable and self-sufficient by growing our own food locally. There's such a demand for it. And by involving people of all ages in the community, uh, in the community farm. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Susan Lance. That was an easy one. Hi, I'm Susan Lance. I live in Lyman Road. I'm in Ward 3. I want to thank not only you guys who are working really hard, I want to thank all of us. I think we are bending over backwards to do uh, what we can and being open and fair and uh, come up with the best solution for our community. And I have another little layer of thinking that I would like to put on that. This process began... Use the microphone, Susan. Bring it up more? There, okay. Uh, this process began... <coughs> Uh, oh, a couple months ago, and um, it was slated for the city to buy this land and it was going to become all recreational fields. And some citizens intervened and uh, went on and brought up this idea of keeping it farmland. Uh, people were in interested in that and they took hold of that. And so, so on and so forth. He, gotten where we are. Uh, there's some for a mixed use, some for one side, some for the other. And in the spirit of cooperation and compromise and a new understanding of the situation, um, all of this, all of this work is being done, everything is being entertained. To me, the question is, if prime farmland is important to save, how does it make sense not to save all of it? How does the argument work for some of the land, but not for all? Why do we stop thinking highest use of land after we designate 20, 25, 30 acres, whatever? If it's important, vital, and economically feasible to keep part of it in farmland, how can we possibly not keep it all? 
What we're doing is trying to please all contenders, all sides. We want to be fair, etc., etc., etc. Right now, I see our job sort of as one of tough love, if you will. Make the really difficult decision, perhaps unpopular with some, but the one that serves the best need for our community and its future. In 20 years, the children of today could be saying, what in the world were they thinking? Digging a prime farmland for playing fields? Or they could be saying, thank heavens our elders had the sense to preserve our farmland so we could better feed ourselves. There's nothing wrong bad or ridiculous about playing soccer. It is excellent exercise for kids, along with many other attributes. But it doesn't have to be at the expense of growing food. If the bean farm is primarily prime farmland, let's make the tough decision and keep it all farmland. Then let's form a new task force and find the soccer field that a community like Northampton <coughs> should have. Thank you. Thank you. Deb Jacobs? I'm Deb Jacobs. I live at 82 Grove Avenue Leeds. Um, it's in the Yankee Hill section, so I'm on high ground. Um, so I don't have to worry about um, too much flooding, although there are a lot of wetlands around the river. I'd like to um, thank you all for the work that you've done. I think it's pretty exciting to think about the city uh, getting uh, a prime piece of farmland. And even though I played um, D-League softball for um, many, many years, um, I like to eat as well. And I'd like to see it um, stay primarily agriculture. <coughs> I, I realize that uh, a compromise is being asked, and I would ask that the greatest compromise be made by um, the um, people interested in sports, just because uh, it's so hard to get good soil. And I, I think that um, as a birder, I'm, I'm more excited about farm fields um, and, uh, and, and conservation land where I can, I can um, do that kind of passive recreation. I'd love to see um, uh, community gardens. And I'd also like the city to think about uh, fruit trees that would be um, fruit and nut trees that could be part of community gardens, uh, high bush blueberries. I think that would be a big <coughs> component that is lacking from the community gardens up, uh, by the state hospital. And um, those of us who live in the Western part um, could really use uh, community gardens. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diana Riddle. <coughs> I'm Diana Riddle. I live on uh, Pine Street, Ward 5. And I'm here to support the agricultural use of the land and also to read a letter from the um, Mass Audubon. Members of the Bean Family Farm Task Force, first of all, let me thank you for your valuable work and for ensuring that there will be a continuing benefit of this lovely old farm to the residents of Northampton. Several of our members have asked me to weigh in about the planning for the Bean Family Farm, and, it's per and that is the purpose of this letter. For those of you who do not know Arcadia, its 766-acre Mass Audubon Sanctuary with about 500 acres in Northampton, I manage Arcadia and the other Mass Audubon sanctuaries in the Connecticut River Valley. While I'm not able to address and weigh all the compelling needs of the community specific to the bean property, as you must do, I'm knowledgeable about the habitat management decisions and about trends in communities regarding land use, and also about how values are shifting regarding land use and management decisions. I think that you have a very unique opportunity here. These are the factors I would like you to consider. Farmland can be an excellent type of habitat for wildlife. Arcadia is first and foremost a world-class habitat. Even Mass Audubon members, volunteers, and friends who love Arcadia are too close to it to remember every day the rarity of the floodplain forest, the success of the grassland restoration and early successional restoration, 
and biological richness of the Martian River. This diversity of habitat has built and sustained diversity and numbers of species in a special place right here in our city. We think of more exotic places when we think about wildlife. In large part, this success is because of habitat management decisions. <coughs> We have frequently cl collaborated with the Northampton Planning Department and the Northampton Conservation Commission, which deserve credit for helping Arcadia to implement its objectives. We specifically set out to preserve and to restore certain kinds of habitat, often attracting state and federal funds to do so. And in recent years, Mass Audubon biologists purposefully planned to surround Arcadia's core habitat with farm fields. The habitat value is that farm fields, after they've served our human food production needs are an excellent resource for migratory species, for food, and for shelter. The second factor is right now, all over the Commonwealth, we are at Mass Audubon, are hearing about the strong interest in food production and community-based agriculture in particular. You may, know, you may also know Mass Audubon is a leader in the field of education for children and for adults. Arcadia offers life learning from nature, nurture, nursery school, and day camps through framework-based science education in schools, <coughs> through internships for high school and colleges, and up to on-site learning for working and retired adults. Our members and host towns and cities all over Massachusetts are telling us that local food production is very important to them, especially food production that will benefit the community such as the CSA model. Because of the benefit to people and wildlife, Arcadia has started a partnership with the Mountain View CSA Farm in East Hampton, which will be using acreage at Arcadia. I'm seeking other similar partnerships for other sanctuaries I manage. I understand that such a model is being proposed for the bean farm, and I believe there's wisdom in that option. I also understand the farm is historic, and I know that because of this, its location near the river, it has habitat management potential. CSAs are educational and connect people to the land. Food production at this time has to be given high priority. I know that you're charged with meeting many needs and some of them are competing. I sympathize with that. It's not my intention to complicate your decision by making process, but it is my intention to express enthusiasm for the food production and habitat management options that I understand you have before you. In my experience, there's a need and bean farms a very exciting possibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Rachel Chandler Work. It's Mary Chandler. One more after you. Um, Street, um, right, over five, uh, a little louder, Rachel. All right. Um, I wanted to speak about the Winter Fair for those of you who didn't attend. It was held last uh, Saturday at Smith Vocational. Um, I know one person spoke about it, but I wanted to uh, let you know because I was there for the whole event and can attest to the enthusiasm of both vendors and the public and also the constant and heavy flow of traffic. There were lines the length of the cafeteria for winter greens. Many farmers sold out of some, if not all, of their products. One farmer told me that it was his most successful single market ever. And this is a farmer that has been around for a while. That's very significant. I have heard from the organizers that there were some 1,500 in attendance, and I believe that was not counting kids in my open there are many. 200 people passed through the doors in the first 20 minutes. It was a great community event in which the community participated as volunteers, organizers, consumers, and advocates. There is no question regarding our community's interest in local food. I grew up in Northampton. I went to school right here. I played soccer right out there. I agree with the importance of organized sports. I've also farmed and, and or grown my own food in the valley for about 10 years. The Bean Farm is a beautiful, historically significant, and viable farm that has been in agriculture for generations and should remain in agriculture for generations. As others have said, there is a huge and growing market and interest in uh, local, local produce and in farm-based education. I have no question that if done well, the farmer can make a living on this land and our kids and community can benefit greatly. Thank you. Uh, we've only got two more names. Uh, Darcy Sweeney. Good evening. 
my name is Darcy Sweeney. I'm from Florence, and I would also like to speak about keeping the bar, uh, bean farm in agricultural use. I'd like to give another example of a very successful CSA. This is the Intervale Community Farm in Burlington, Vermont. I'm familiar with it because my daughter worked there for several years. And it has a couple of things in common with the bean farm. It's located on a river, and it's within the city limits of Burlington, Vermont. Um, it cultivates 20 acres to produce organic vegetables, berries, herbs, and flowers. It serves 500 Burlington families and gives thousands of pounds of food to the needy every year. It's a not-for-profit not for CSA, Community Supported Agricultural Farm. It's operated by its membership through an elected board and farm manager. And it employs three full-time year-round employees and about eight seasonal employees. And part of its mission is to train aspiring farmers. Um, it's been a model since it was started around 1990. And as inspiring as it is, it's uh, umbre the umbrella organization of which it is a part, which is called the Intervale Center, is equally inspiring. This is the Intervale Center is also a nonprofit organization, and is dedicated to developing this area uh, of uh, Burlington. It's about 350 acres as a local agricultural resource while protecting the natural resources. Um, so actually, the Intervale Community Farm is just one of about a dozen farms managed by this Intervale Center. And the Intervale Center has programs that run the gamut from agricultural programs for at-risk youth to building a food processing plant for local agriculture to helping conserve and manage riverbank land. I'm Marlene Morin, and um, I have the petition from the Grow Food Northampton that has 838 signatures on it today, and there will be more. And I'm here to present it to the um, task force. So if you could pass out a copy for each of you uh, to read, I'll read it to everyone. This is the petition itself with all the comments um, by the people. And before I read the petition, I'd just like to ask the task force and, and everyone involved in the decision making to respect the neighbors or all the residents of the bean farm area, uh, particularly the abutters, who are very worried about uh, the noise that will be generated by the games. Uh, they are elevated, especially the fairway, the condos, and some of the members are here. They didn't want to speak up. Uh, their houses are above the fields, this area. They will have to listen to this noise um, from the games, unfortunately, and, and they're very upset about it. Um, and also, when I talk about residents, also the wildlife that is there is incredible. And that's what keeps me coming back every day um, to help to preserve this in agriculture because I've spent a lot of time on the farm um, and I've seen the birds and the tracks and the animals there. It's so protected, the river. So it's such a perfect place for wildlife. They don't have to cross the road. <coughs> and I was there one day uh, with members of the Agricultural Commission and we saw the hawk, the hawk that I talked about the first day when I addressed um, the city council. The hawks in that area are incredible. Um, the place is beautiful and it is filled with birds and other wildlife. And aside from that, the other residents of the neighborhood um, are the people who live on Spring Street and live on Florence Road. And I like to tell a little story myself about um, no, a November afternoon when I was mowing my lawn, it was two o'clock in the afternoon, everyone was out. It was the last beautiful day in the fall on Florence Road. All my neighbors were out. And along came a car 80 miles an hour around the curve and crashed maybe 25 feet up the road from me. Shortly, not long after that, we had the, the gentleman who died at the intersection of Spring Street and Florence Road and Ryan Road. And no, these were not soccer players driving these cars. The point is, we have a very serious problem on Florence Road, and it's so bad that I addressed the parking and transportation along with my city councilor, Marion LaBarge, and they gave Florence Road a very high priority. They said, yes, this is a problem for traffic. If there are uh, five or six or seven fields here, we're going to have Island Road all over again, down Florence Road to Spring Street, just like the gentleman said. They're going, they're, why can't you build some fields closer to 91, so they don't have to come. They will come flying off 91. Uh, Maple Leaf and Western United, they provide directions how to get to the fields on their website. I can see it now. They'll come flying down Florence Road, 
They'll be late, they'll be going 80 miles an hour. Right now, we don't have the police to stop the speeding on Florence Road. We don't have the money. Um, it's a no passing zone and people go 80 miles an hour up that road. That's why there's so many accidents. It's horrendous, it's dangerous. We live here. The more fields you put there, the more traffic there will be. 100 parking spaces, they're just telling you, that's for one game. 100 more cars, additional cars. We just can't handle it, never mind the beans who are gonna have to live there when they all go roaring down the, uh, into the bean farm uh, for the game. And also, I'd like to mention, um, Kevin <coughs> brought up the city-wide recreation potential assessment. I'd like to point out on page two, it says the bean farm says not a good idea. It recommends it's prime farmland. Um, it doesn't recommend the bean farm. $40,000 the city paid for this. And they recommend, don't use the bean farm. It's prime agricultural land. Uh, maybe pages five and six list a huge number of <coughs> recreation potential that the city can look at. And I wish they would, there's two pages here. So now back to the petition. Um, <coughs> 838 residents have already signed it, asking to keep the farm uh, primarily in agriculture. And I can't believe it. I didn't keep a copy for myself. Oh. I have a lot to say, I'm sorry. Um. The petition states that whereas the Bean Family Farm on Spring Street in Florence, Mass represents important farming history for our community, having been farmed continuously since pre-colonial times, Whereas the soil type on the majority of this property meets the USDA requirements to be considered prime farmland, defined as land that is best suited to producing food, feed, forage, fiber, and oilseed crops. It has the soil quality, growing season, and moisture supply needed to economically produce a sustained high yield of crops when it is treated and managed using acceptable farming methods. Prime farmland produces the highest yields with minimal inputs of energy and economic resources, and farming it results in the least damage to the environment. And whereas the converging crisis of climate change, global resource depletion, and economic instability indicate need to protect our community's food security by strengthening our local food production. Whereas there is an in increasing demand for food grown in our region and locally produced food keeps money in our local economy and improves our health. Whereas the Sustainable Northampton Plan establishes <coughs> as a target maintaining farmland area in the city. And whereas the Northampton Agricultural Commission voted unanimously to recommend uh, that the bean property continue to be farmed. Therefore, as citizens of Northampton, we urge the city to maintain farming as the primary use of the bean property and to put this farmland in permanent agricultural preservation signed by 838 uh, citizens to date. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Well, that uh, is the last name, and uh, now we have more work to do. Uh, thought I got to the bottom of the pile, but uh, we got a lot more to do now. Uh, we're gonna we have a working meeting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, and uh, but it's it's there will be no public comment. It's going to be at the council chambers. And we're going to set up the next uh, uh, public forum tomorrow morning, and uh, it'll be posted. You'll all know when it's coming. Um, I'm not I'm not even going to say when, but it's going to be shortly. Uh, the time constraints are, are pretty tough. But thank you everybody for coming. I know it's late. And thanks again. It was, uh, it was a pleasure.